seen that Bernard says the big thing we have to learn about life is that there are all sorts of changes intrinsic to the spiritual process and uh, changes that uh, come from a number of different sources and he said that one of the things that we have to do is to make sure that we lean on events and lean on ourselves so that the right changes come about so that there's a possibility that our spiritual growth will be continued Yet, top of page 13, it would be wrong to conclude that Bernard was pessimistic about the possibilities of human happiness in this life. In fact, he says, listen, don't ever forget that you're going to have to work very hard and you're going to pass through seasons of great dread and that you're going to have failures and so forth. And these are built into every life. And if, if you're not naturally gifted as a failure, then God will do something to make sure that you fail anyhow. But at the same time, there's no reason to be unhappy about it. <laughs> so he's not saying, oh, you know, roll on death, it's going to be a gloomy life and all this kind of thing. But on the contrary, he says, accept this as a fact and be happy about it. Be content, at least. Measured quantitatively, routine and labour predominate. To quote our constitutions, our life is ordinary and obscure and laborious. Uh, it goes on and on, and it's not exciting. You know, if somebody comes in with a machine gun and uh, asks you to uh, give up your faith or die, well, it's a bit exciting to be martyred, so I believe. Um, it, you don't fall asleep in the course of being martyred. Um, but the ordinary things, the daily grind, day after day, we do fall asleep. We are bored by them, quite frankly. We're bored by the liturgy, we're bored by our reading, we're bored by our work. And it's only because we're standing up that we don't fall asleep. <laughs> and so measured quantitatively, routine and labour predominate, but this is all wiped out by the moments of sheer bliss when the divine potential of ordinary existence is suddenly manifest. And really that's, that's what changes in our life as we advance that we're able to see the divine in the, in the ordinary more and more. At the beginning, it's only labour and routine. The same life lived 40 years later may well be a source of, of great happiness uh, and great spiritual uh, delight. But even so, even though if we only belong to the infantry and we only get an occasional glimpse of the other side of life, then even so, those glimpses are enough to outweigh many years of labour. Happy are those who are found worthy occasionally, even if it be rarely, to drink from this torrent of delight. Even though it does not flow all the time, at least sometimes the water of wisdom and the fountain of life spring up so that they be in such persons a source of water leaping up into eternal life. And this onrush of water brings joy to God's city all the time and in abundance. I only wish that occasionally it would flood our earthly mountains and that he would not disdain to visit some of them so that once they are adequately watered some few rare drops might filter down to us who are in the valleys so that we need no longer remain dry and sterile. In a region which is never thus watered which is bypassed by the streams of wisdom, there can on be only unhappiness, neediness, and a great famine. So without God in our life, without any possibility of spiritual consolation, we get unhappiness, neediness, and a great hunger. But in the ordinary events of life, if we have an ordinary fidelity, we certainly will receive uh, breathing spaces from time to time. Not every day, the water will never be on tap, but we will never die of thirst. <laughs> this is where I, I think it has to be said that, you know, with regard to this whole question of 
relative degrees of happiness and contentment in our life that we need to work at being happy in one sense, to work at our contentment, uh, that to recognize our life with all its liability and with all its labor, and to say, well, this is the way it is, this comes from God's hand in one sense or another, and that therefore, if I've got any faith at all, it should generate in me a will for happiness. And occasionally one comes across a rather tragic incident where people just don't want to be happy they're pleased to be unhappy. They enjoy their misery and um, they won't take the steps that will lead them to happiness. And that's you know, not only sad for them, but it's also disastrous spiritually. One of my favorite quotes, I'm surprised I didn't put it in here, is from uh, Supercantica 11.12. And Bernard is saying, okay, don't forget your sins, remember your sins, but don't do it all the time, it'll drive you crazy. Um, therefore, he says, my advice to you, friends, is to turn aside from troubled and anxious reflection on your own progress and escape to the easier paths of remembering the good things which God has done. In this way, instead of becoming upset by thinking about yourself, you will find relief by turning your attention to God. Sorrow for sin is indeed a necessary thing, but it should not prevail all the time. It's necessary, rather, that happier recollections of the divine bounty should counterbalance it, lest the heart should become hardened through too much sadness, and so perish through despair. Sadness is a very much a no-no for St. Bernard. People who are sad are on the way to destruction. The heart become hardened through too much sadness. So if, you, if you're sad, you become immune to happiness. You, the heart hardens. And then it gets desperate, and then it despairs. Four stages. Sadness, hardening of heart, desperation, perish. <laughs> End. And so not to try and make of ourselves uh, martyrs to happiness or to think that if we're unhappy, uh, that's the way it should be. There's a whole difference between laboriousness and between suffering and between pain and unhappiness. And it's important that we build up our sense of contentment by remembering constantly the good things which God has done by trying to accept uh, what his providence has given to us, not uh, as a punishment or a pain, but as something which really is for us uh, a source of growth even though we don't understand it at present. So just to look at the last word on alternation, not chronologically, but as far as we're concerned, comes perhaps in a letter written to Pope Innocent II in 1134. If sadness were our continual state, who could bear it? If, on the other hand, things always went well, who would not think little of them? Wisdom, the careful controller of all things, alternates the temporal life of his chosen ones with a necessary changing between good things and bad. By such a regimen, they will neither be crushed by adversity nor lose discipline through too much joy. Also, it's by this means that joys are more appreciated and difficulties more readily endured. Blessed be God forever. So that's more or less all that I have to say about um, alternation except to read one rather long text from uh, number 74, which we're not going to be able to de deal with in detail. But it's an interesting text, if you can bear me, bear with me while I read it, because uh, it describes Bernard's view of how God visits the soul. So we're going to start at, um, at uh, 74, number 5. The visitation of... The, how do we experience the word coming, at the, coming to the soul? And it's one of the most beautiful and lyric passages in the whole of St. Bernard. And uh, you'll, you'll hear echoes of Augustine in a number of places, uh, as with, with, with other things. So I might just read it through, if you can, as I say, if you can bear with me. Uh, and then we'll go back and just point out another things. But it just 
expresses in a very colourful way this whole theme of alternation. The context is, he says, the word has withdrawn, the soul cries out to the word, cries out in its loneliness, in its lack of love, in its sense of desolation, cries out to the word to come back, and the word returns. But now, he says, you must bear with my foolishness for a moment. As I promised, I'm going to speak of how this happens in my own case. For it is for your benefit that I speak about myself, even though it's not good to do so. And if you derive some profit from my foolishness, then I shall feel better about it. I admit in all foolishness that the word has visited me several times. Usually, when he enters me, I do not advert to his coming. I sense that he is present, and I remember that he had been absent. Sometimes I have been able to anticipate his entry, but I have never been able directly to experience either his coming or his going. I, I confess that I am ignorant of where he comes from when he enters my soul, and of where he goes to when he departs. I do not know the manner of his entry, nor how he leaves. This is in accordance with the text of Scripture. Nobody knows whence he comes or where he goes to. This should occasion no surprise, since he is the one of whom it is said, and your footprints shall not be known. He does not come in through the eyes, for he has no colour, nor through the ears, since he makes no sound. It is not through the nose that he comes, since he does not mingle with the air, since it is the mind he touches. To the atmosphere he gives not being, but he gives being, not odour. He does not gain entry through the mouth, since he is not food or drink. He cannot be contacted by touch, since he is impalpable. How then does he find entrance? Perhaps he does not enter at all, since he does not come from the outside, nor is he any external thing. But on the other hand, neither does he come from inside me, since he is good, and I know that there is nothing good inside me. I ascended to what was highest in me, and behold, the word loomed loftier. I went down to my depths, and he was found to be yet deeper. If I looked outside, I saw him beyond my exterior. If I gazed within, he was even more inward. It was then that I realized the truth of what I read, in him we live and move and have our being. Happy is that one in whom dwells he by whom he lives. Happy the man who lives for him and is moved by him. You might ask, therefore, how it is that I know that the word has arrived, since all his ways are beyond scrutiny. I know because he is alive and active. As soon as he arrives within, he shakes to life my drowsy soul. He moves and softens and pierces my heart, which had previously been hard and stony and distorted. The word begins to root up and destroy, to build up and to plant. He waters the arid lands and brings light to the gloom. He opens up what was closed and sets fire to what was frigid. And at the same time he makes the twisted roads straight and the rough ways smooth. And all this is done so that my soul may bless the Lord and all that is within me may give thanks to his holy name. So it is that when the bridegroom comes to me, as he does sometimes, he never signals his presence by any indicator, neither by voice nor by vision nor by the sound of his step. By no such movement do I become aware of him, nor does he penetrate my being through the senses. Only by the movement of the heart, as I have already said, do I come to realize that he is present. It is by the expulsion of my vices and the repression of carnal affects that I become aware of the might of his, of his power. I am lost at the depth of his wisdom when he subjects my secret life to scrutiny and correction. It is from a slight improvement in my behaviour that I experience his gentle goodness. It is from the reformation and renovation of the spirit of my mind, that is, of my inner man, 
that I perceive his beauty and attractiveness. From the consideration of all these things taken together, I come to be overwhelmed by his abundant goodness. And when it happens that the word departs, it is as, as though you were to remove the fire from beneath a boiling pot. Immediately it turns lifeless and lukewarm and begins to cool. For me, this is the sign of his departure. My soul necessarily feels sad until he returns. And the indication of his coming back is that my heart within me returns to its normal warmth. It's an interesting text. Bernard claims to be talking about his own experience, and perhaps he is. But I think he's talking far more universally than that because the whole thing is a pastiche of scriptural texts. And on the other hand, there are, as I said, a number of allusions to Augustine. 2 Corinthians 2, allow my fear, foolishness, and Paul talking about his own case. But listen to what he's saying, is that... Um, Usually when he enters me, I do not advert to his coming. In other words, the word doesn't come in as though somebody comes late for the lecture, comes through the door. But it's just a, a, a oh, you're there. It's just a, a discovery, a recognition of something which is present all the time. I don't see him coming, but my attention is suddenly turned to the presence of God within me. Uh, when this happens. It's not in the sense of a big arrival, but discovering the word present within me. And he, he asks, how could he come? Because it, it's not a sensible experience. It doesn't come through the eyes or the ears or the nose or the taste or the touch. Uh, very Augustinian thing. You know, go through all the senses. And then this thing that you find so often in Augustine of searching for God. You might remember the same famous passage in the Confessions. But I called out to all created things, and they replied in chorus, We are not God, but he is the one who made us. It's the same thing. I went within myself, seeking God. Was he within? Is he he's not outside? Is he within? So he went to what is highest in me, and the, womb, uh, and the word loomed loftier. Even though I go to my highest power, yet the word is there, but somehow larger. I went to my depths and he was found to be yet deeper. If I looked outside, he was there. If I grazed within, he is more, even more inward to myself than myself. So I never quite contain the word, never quite contain within my own gaze, but whatever I see of myself, whatever I see of reality, the word is already there. So we're talking about a heightened spiritual perception was then that I realized the truth of what I'd read, the text of St. Paul's uh, speech on the uh, Acropolis before the Areopagus, uh, in him we live and move and have our being. It's pseudo Epiphanius, isn't it? Or somebody like that. Uh, in him we move and uh, we live and move and have our being. We discover the word is interior to us. Everything that we are, somehow or other, the word is already there. And then, how do you know that the Word is within? Well, he says the Word doesn't come empty-handed. God's action in us is never idle, but it's living and active, as the Epistle to Hebrews says. And how do you know? Well, I know because when he's present, I wake up. That's why. He wakes me up. And remember uh, Cashin's uh, definition of compunction, whatever it is that rouses the soul from drowsiness and lukewarmness. It's entirely this, uh, this impression that, that Bernard is saying. He shakes to life my drowsy soul. In other words, generally my spiritual powers are in low gear. All of a sudden, with the presence, the visitation of the word, is that the powers that I have become activated. He p moves and softens and pierces my heart. Notice the feeling words here. Uh, monastic prayer is always feelingful. So he moves me. And he softens me. It's no question of hardening. It pierces, compunctio, huh? my heart, which had previously been hard and stony and distorted. Away from God, that's the way we become. Even though we're very strict observance, no matter what, if, if God isn't acting upon us, then we become hard and stony and distorted. And what does the word do? Well, he draws on Jeremiah. The same things as the abbot visitor is supposed to do. 
to root up and destroy, to build and to plant, the uh, mission of Jeremiah. The wo this is what he does. He doesn't just come and say hi, but he begins to get to work to clean up the house, like the mother-in-law arriving. Uh, it doesn't just come to sit down, but starts going through the house and cleaning up all the mess. Huh? The word begins to root up and destroy. So the word doesn't just come to confirm us, but to really get our life into act, to root up and destroy, to build up and to plant. And so other things. He waters the arid lands, going into Deuteronomy Isaiah. Waters the arid lands and brings light to the gloom. He opens up what was closed and sets fire to what was frigid. All the, all the, the scriptural images of salvation are images of reversal. And so what the word does is he takes our normal state and turns it upside down. What was cold becomes hot, uh, what was closed become open, what was dark becomes lightsome. He waters the arid lands and brings light to the gloom. He opens up what was closed and sets fire to what was frigid. At the same time he makes the twisted road straight and the rough way smooth. Again, 2nd Isaiah and Psalm 102, 103. And all this is done so that my, my soul may bless the Lord and all that is within me, so that my whole being may have this moment of puritas cordis, pure prayer, which all my being is united uh, to praise, to bless the Lord. All that is within me may give thanks to his name. And so it is when the bridegroom comes, as he does sometimes, is that word, he never singles, signals his presence by any indicator. There's not a voice or a vision or the sound of his steps. The old monastic tradition is the monk wouldn't cross the road to see a miracle. He's too busy uh, on other things. He's too busy with the reality to worry about apparitions and things like that. There's a famous story of Evagrius. Um, uh, two monks, walk, uh, one monk walking down the desert road saying his prayers. And the devil gets a bit upset at this and uh, decides to distract him. So he transfigures himself into an angel of light and uh, walks along beside him. The monk went on saying his prayer. So he gave him a bit of a nudge and said, <coughs> <laughs> and the monk just turned to the left and uh, saw the angel of light there and said, go away, can't you see I'm saying my prayers? And Evagrius says, and the devil was not able to lead that monk into delusion. Whereas people who are into uh, what does he call them? Visions and voices and apparitions and so forth are very easily led into delusion uh, by anything. Um, but the monastic tradition is you know, to prefer a lack of these things to an abundance of them. So it is that when the bri bridegroom comes to me, as he does sometimes, it's not a matter of uh, vision. He, does, he never signals his presence by any indicator neither by voice, nor by vision, nor by the sound of his step. By no such movement do I become aware of him, do, nor does he pen penetrate my being through the senses. It's only by the movement of the heart that I realize his presence. It's only by my own response by that I know that he's there. And you could sometimes say the same with diabolical apparitions and so forth, or presences which is one of these realities of life that we don't understand and we're inclined to, to push off. But sometimes people will say that the only the, the, the sign of this kind of mysterious event is a great feeling of dread that seizes them and fear and coldness, like a hand gripping the heart. It's only by the movement of the heart that we know that we detect some of these unseen presences, in this case, the word. It's by the expulsion of my vices. You know the words present because gradually my vices are expelled. Gradually the carnal affects. You know, not only the vices, but the tendencies from which vices come are progressively repressed, that I become aware of the might of his power. And suddenly I'm lost in wonderment at the depth of his wind wisdom when he subjects my secret life to scrutiny and correction. And sometimes when we really uh, suddenly have a door opened on our own life and we really perceive an area which, needs, which is judged by God, which needs correction, it's not a negative thing. It's a thing of great mercy because we feel immensely grateful that somebody has taken care to show us the way ahead. It's by negating this particular thing. 
It is from a slight improvement in my behaviour that I experience his gentle goodness. We don't expect too much. It's just a slight improvement in my behaviour that's the real sign of a genuine uh, spiritual experience. It's from the reformation and renovation of the spirit of my mind, um, Romans 12, 12 2, isn't it? That is, of my inner man, that I perceive his beauty and attractiveness. It's from all these things taken together that I'm overwhelmed by his abundant goodness. So there is a sense of real ecstasy, if you don't mind that word, going out of myself, just completely being swamped by a sense of the goodness of God, recognizing all the various other components, myself, my sinfulness, my limitations, uh, my ambitions, my good desires and so forth, but totally forgetting them, being swamped by the goodness of God. Then he says, but unfortunately it doesn't last. We can't patent it and institutionalize it and stamp our name upon it. And when the word departs, you know, nice mystical image here, it is as though you were to remove the fire from beneath a boiling pot. Look at the water in a boiling pot and it's full of life. It's bubbling. It's bubbling and it's hot and it's going everywhere. Take away the fire, immediately it turns lifeless. All the life goes, it becomes flat. And lukewarm, it gets cold and begins to cool. Sometimes people say that describes what happens when people enter monastic life. You know, or the when they arrive, they're all bubbling and you know, full of life and then it goes Unfortunately, it's more true than, than perhaps it should be. Immediately, it turns lifeless and lukewarm and begins to cool. For me, this is the sign of his departure. My soul necessarily, again that word, feels sad until he returns. In other words, when it's God's plan that sometimes I should be lifeless and lukewarm and getting colder by the minute. It's part of his plan so that I'll really want the fire turned back on again. The indication of his coming back is that my heart within me returns to its normal warmth. I thought it was worthwhile reading that just, just to make the point that Bernard does uh, say a lot about spiritual experience if you want to chase it up. But it, it conforms largely with exactly the general body of his teaching that um, you know there are positive and negative elements about it. And the, the best way to exclude the positive is to exclude the negative. You know, if you're only going to, if you're going to repress all the negative information coming up from the unconscious about yourself, you will never have genuine spiritual experience. That's why um, Cashin starts off with, uh, you know, the, the spiritual life. Well, you get in and get used to things and so forth, and you go on to more advanced stage, and that's dealing with the vices. Um, in other words, confronting the eight vices. And I remember we had a retreat once on Cashin's treatment of the vices by a man that had done his doctoral thesis on it, a friend of mine, and, uh, and David Walker, and he, he began by apologising for speaking to monks about vices. <laughs> but the fact of, of Cashin's teaching, I mean, he didn't know much about monks, did he? But, but Cashin's teaching is that we've got all these vices. They're the eight tribes of Canaan or the seven tribes of Canaan and, and, and the Egyptians that we have to fight and before we enter the promised land. And we don't enter the promised land until we fight each one of them. Good old semi-Pelagian Cashin. But um, the point is that all of us have to face these thoughts, these vices. And if we think we're going to slide through life without it, um, well, it just means that we've got an interesting life ahead of us. Um, we can put off the confrontation with these vices, but until we've actually confronted them and, and in some way dealt with them, not actively, but with the help of God, that we'll never start to make any spiritual progress. We're just repressing uh, the carnal effects, and we're not really eliminating them or struggling against them. But to get the good side of things, you've got to also take the bad side of things. And it's only by allowing ourselves to alternate in a natural way between good experience and bad experience to allow ourselves to, uh, to accept uh, meekly both the carrot and the stick, uh, allow ourselves to make use of different means that are available to us, allow our communities to express at different moments different 
uh, manifestations of the monastic charism. All this kind of alternation is integral to our experience as, as living a life of desire. Um, if we only just focus on the positive things of desiring God and yearning about Him, they'll quickly dry up. The only long-term way of doing it is to take a more global view. All right, we'll call it a day, dead on time. Uh, we have just finished a section, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> which means that we need to ask ourselves a few more questions. Uh, make sure we process material. And um, So I'm going to ask you more or less the same things. First of all, what three points um, from this section stand out in your mind as having, you know, what three points would you want to remember this time next year? And it's not three points that are useful for writing a doctoral thesis on Bernard, but three points which seem to be, uh, have some relevance for where you are at this time in life. First question. Second question is similar to the first, the first ones that I gave you. Can you just list for yourself a few times in which you've been visited, in which you've experienced grace? Uh, and the third question, is there anything in this section which would make you examine your own behaviour, your own outlooks? Uh, are there things in your life that need to be questioned? Uh, do, do, are there passages that seem to present a challenge to you, in other words? And three of those. But it's just a, a way of making sure it doesn't sail over your head, but keep applying it to your own life, because Bernard was interested only in helping people to live and to pray. If we read him only intellectually, we're not reading him on the right wavelength. To understand him really, to get where he's at, we've got to be prepared to be uh, admonished concerning my living and my praying. Okay? Go and be admonished. <laughs>